the Oxford High School shooter can serve life in prison without parole. Judge Kwame Rowe announced the ruling in the Miller hearing earlier this morning. This crime is not the result of impetuosity or recklessness, nor does the crime reflect the hallmarks of youth. Defendant carefully and meticulously planned and carried out the shooting. Accordingly, the court, having weighed all factors and noting the Michigan Supreme Court's admonition in Taylor, finds that the prosecution has rebutted the presumption by clear and convincing evidence that a sentence to life without parole is a disproportionate sentence. All right, so let's go ahead and get to Sean Lave, who is live at the courthouse to explain what's next for us. And Sean, it was a very detailed um, procedure that the judge went through in explaining exactly why he came to the conclusion that he did today. I was just texting with one of the attorneys representing some of the families of this awful shooting, Christy. He called it measured and not a surprise at all. Courthouse right over there where Judge Kwame Rowe made, made this really big decision here. And the Oxford School shooter remains in this jail here, uh, the Oakland County Jail. However, sentencing is set for December 8th. Now, the judge opening the door for uh, the sentence that could be life without parole for a juvenile, that's a big deal. However, when sentencing happens on uh, December 8th, that's anyone's guess what will actually be handed down to this shooter, Christy. I think what was really interesting, Sean, and I know you were watching this as this happened, is he went through the seven um, criteria of the Miller hearing in terms of what his age was, his maturity, um, his uh, appreciative of consequences, and also home life as well. And we also heard when he was talking about the possibility of rehabilitation, and that's when I believe some of the most disturbing details came in and talking about what led up to the shooting, what he had done, the videos that he had watched, and even even his behavior in jail after the shooting. Um, and he was able to access uh, violent videos there as well. Absolutely. And you're hitting the nail right on the head because the judge did a great job uh, framing this, painting the picture of you know, who this youth is and what's happened here. And the U.S. Supreme Court says, look, the prosecution, if they want to try a juvenile as an adult, they have, they're the ones with the burden of proof here to come to that hearing uh, that we all watched and present evidence to say uh, the sentence, uh, life without parole, is appropriate for a juvenile. So it's a very important decision. But the judge really painted the picture, kind of brought all this in the frame, and you're hitting the, the most important points. Yes, we talked about mental health. That was a big deal. Talked about home life, of course. We know a lot about that. But the judge said uh, his behavior inside this jail after the shooting, even Today, uh, the you know, couple of years after he's been in here, he's been focused on looking up violent acts or been, he, the judge says, obsessed with violence still here in the jail. So he said if he's obsessed with violence leading up to the Oxford School shooting and taking those lives and hurting those people and terrorizing the community, he said, but there's not going to be a lot of rehabilitation or it's a slim chance, he said, for rehabilitation if he's sitting in jail right now and still obsessed with violence. That was one of the big keys the judge uh, pointed to today. Yeah, and, you know, Sean, you talk about terrorizing a community, and I know so many people were watching this hearing today and wanted to see what was happening. And I know you've had some contact with some of the families, and uh, this um, had to have been difficult to hear a lot of the detail again. The judge went into graphic detail about um, the shooter's journals, um, the, the I guess, the step-by-step -step of when he got into the school and the way that the shooting happened, hearing these things over and over again, and then leading us to what the sentencing will be when we get to have the victim impact statements on December 8th. This is still a very large traumatic process for our community who's watching this play out as a whole. Well, the judge even said, look, he pled guilty to a terrorism charge, terrorizing the community. He said that means 2,000 people are victims of that. Each and every one of them are welcome to come to sentencing and talk about what this has done to them. Of course, the parents of you know, Hannah St. Juliana, Tate Meir, uh, Madison Baldwin, Justin Schilling, uh, and the other kids that were hurt in this, uh, taking gunfire, uh, but others terrorized by this, traumatized to this day, can also come. 2,000 people, uh, Christy. So he made a point to also bring that up. Also, as you mentioned, walking through exactly the moves he made uh, was really stunning to hear that. So. I'm sure it was very difficult for families. Some uh, reaction is pouring in. Uh, grateful for today's decision is pretty much what we're hearing right now.
All right, Sean Lay live at the courthouse in Oakland County. Thanks so much, or actually at the, the jail there. So thanks so much for the report, and we'll look forward to your comprehensive reports at 4, 5, and 6 tonight. All right, well, joining me now is George Danini. He's an attorney with Butzel. He has extensive experience in criminal and civil cases. George, it's good to see you. Hello, good afternoon. How are you? Well, thanks. And I, I think if you could just go ahead and, and, and explain for all of us really the significance of having this kind of Miller hearing and then the decision that we heard today and the deliberate nature of the judge going through and making sure that everyone knew exactly on each point that he had to consider in this the reasons why he said what he did. Yeah, so look, the law, um, the law requires this Miller hearing to be conducted because Essentially, um, it, the law says, the Supreme Court said about a decade ago in this Miller versus Alabama case, um, that a mandatory life imprisonment without the possibility of parole for a minor is unconstitutional. Doesn't mean that can't be the sentence, but it means that the judge needs to go through these factors uh, and be convinced that this is, in fact, an appropriate sentence given these particular circumstances of this. Um, this offense. So uh, the judge did rule that it's possible that he will not get parole, but we don't have the sentence exactly. So what can we look forward to when a sentencing does happen and it's going to be happening on December 8th? Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, nobody's looking forward to this at all, I'm sure. But um, uh, obviously finality is, is something to hope for. Um, so, yes, on December 8th, the, the judge, Judge Rowe, will have a, a full-blown sentencing hearing. Um, we can, I'm sure, anticipate a number of victim impact statements being submitted. I heard just a moment ago, you know, because one of the offenses was that he pled guilty to was a terrorism offense, um, there's the potential for over 2,000-plus victims. Um, and all will have an opportunity, you know, within obvious reason to speak to the prosecutor and the prosecution can put forth that evidence at that time. Um, you know, uh, just because the judge decided this is a potential sentence doesn't mean that's going to be the sentence he imposes, but it certainly appears to be heading in that direction. So, George, when um, the judge talked about each of the categories, and it was age and maturity, uh, consequences, also his home life, um, talking about uh, the homicide offense, the fact uh, of his youth, and was he able to help with uh, preparing his defense, the possibility of rehabilitation, he marked certain things mitigating factors or neutral factors. So um, two of them were mitigating, and the rest were, were neutral. Can you explain to us what that means? Um, yes. So a neutral factor basically not giving that more or, or not weight than any than any other. A mitigating factor is something that he found does um, inure to the defendant Ethan Crumbly's benefit, but not enough to overcome uh, his decision that this is a, a potentially appropriate sentence in this case. Again, you know, in this context. Um, these are all supposed to be viewed as mitigating factors, at least potentially mitigating factors, the five Miller factors, um, and they're not supposed to be aggravating factors. However, the third factor that you just articulated, which is the offense itself, you know, it's hard to, to have sat through four days of these proceedings and listen to some of the witnesses who testified to the prosecution and not find the testimony that gets to be aggravating, because it certainly is. All right, George Danini, an attorney with Butzel, thanks so much for, um, for really helping us uh, understand everything that happened today, and we look forward to speaking with you soon. Okay, thanks so much.